So you probably know the title. That's why you paid the money to come here. Um, driven maybe by different reasons. Um, and this was sort of my reason for getting involved in uh, looking at analogs for carbonate deposition in early rift settings. And we have people coming to us all the time in the company. Uh, you know, we're looking at Brazil, we're looking at Angola. Uh, rift settings, non-marine carbonate settings. Microbial carbonates. I knew a little bit about that stuff, but I'd have to say I couldn't answer a lot of the questions. So we needed to, the little group of us needed to put our heads together and uh, come up uh, first with a suite of analogs to help us better address some of the exploration development scale activities and rift settings. So in this presentation, which is built on a published paper, um, we identified some settings. It's not an exhaustive set of analogs, but it's a good collection. We uh, added to the published descriptions a little bit, summarized them to make them sort of user friendly for first inside of Chevron and then pushed it out through SCPM. And assembled the whole thing into a GIS database, which we published, so everybody can use it. And uh, this was work I did in collaboration with two really great people. Jim Ellis is a remote sensing and GIS specialist, has his own little company out in Northern California, but former Chevron. Sam Perkis sits at a university uh, in Fort Lauderdale, and he's a remote sensing specialist. He's published books on it, but he's kind of pushed the envelope on uh, quantitative interrogation approaches, techniques to use, whether you're looking at things with imagery or outcrops. So a different way of looking at stratigraphy and sedimentology. And what I'm going to talk to you today on is, is published, and this is sort of the backbone publication. I'll come back to this one in a, in a minute because it's a digital publication including a, a GIS, but we summarized it in a AAPG bulletin paper, which I think is what Scott read and invited me to come and give this talk. Um, and we took aspects of the work and published it in a journal sedimentary research paper. So in the next, you know, whatever, 40 minutes, I'm going to try and take the, the key points from these publications and weave the little story that I'll give to you. And we'll do that by uh, a few introductory comments. What's sort of the rationale for analogs? And then I'll quickly overview the analogs and really the guts of the talk a good half of it is some examples of how you can use analogs to try and address some questions you might have to help you with subsurface interpretations. So first of all, the, the rationale for the analogs. This is a, a simplified map. This is not an accurate map of what the South Atlantic margin looks like, and I don't know how right or how wrong it is, to be honest, but it sort of makes the point. Um, you know, there's this rift opening, right? And, uh, you know, Africa and, and South America and Africa splitting apart. At any one point in time, down here, that's probably marine. There might be places where it was vacillating back and forth, marginal marine or not. And then a large part of it up here was non-marine. In some way, shape, or form, a series of basins, sub-basins, lacustrine basins, that at certain times probably were isolated from each other by high areas in between, as shown here times of low lake level. At times of higher lake level, they might have been more connected. So it changes, very dynamic setting. Is this the right number of basins, the shape, the size, their actual locations? Probably not, but it's you know, sort of a schematic, a cartoon. So it makes the point, what, you know, what can we do to further our understanding of the potential types of carbonates and the potential distribution of carbonates in a depositional setting like that? You know, where do you go? to find that kind of information. It's not like we don't have models already to address this. And I have to give a lot of credit to Paul Wright, recently retired from British Gas, Giovanna Della Porta, University in Milan. They've really pushed our understanding with uh, their collaborators. So this is a couple of their models from a paper that Paul published and a talk and poster that Giovanna presented. And they're, you know, they're schematic in themselves, but they kind of show, and there's some names here that you'll see, and even a couple of the analogs that I, I used as well, but you know, where in a setting like this, maybe along a shoreline, uh, around the basement highs out in a lacustrine basin, and maybe at certain times more widespread development of carbonates across the floor of the basin. So there are models out there, and we wanted to add to that a little bit. 
The cross section shows perhaps um, you know, different types of carbonate growth in the shallow edges of the basin, uh, maybe locally where there's faults, there's fluids coming up along faults that could prom promote carbonate <coughs> precipitation. So we wanted to add to that story, and I'd have to say, if you're interested in this topic, and you're working for one of the companies here, and you're not involved with Chris Schultz's program at Syracuse, you should be. You know, Chris has been working with uh, East African Rift Lakes for his whole life, but only in the last couple years is he directing them now into carbonates. So the timing's right, and they're starting the further develop models like this, high lake, lake level, low lake level, different types of carbonate scenarios. They're still looking at the East African Rift Lakes. Lake Turkana is one. Uh, lake Kivu is one that are really kicking off a study now. But they're also looking in the US at Walker Lake. So they've really broadened their carbonate portfolio. So a little plug for Chris's program. So just to segue for a minute, there's a terminology mess. <clears throat> if you're in this carbonate game, we tend to publish a lot of classifications. <clears throat> Everybody's heard this term lately. And in fact, it's been used and misused and been broadened so much, it's almost a useless term already to me. But this term you probably grew up with, and this one maybe we became more familiar with later on. They got included in a classification more recently here, and a couple other names were added. So these you see, this one you see a lot more of because it's a prominent player locally in maybe offshore Brazil. This one most people don't use. But there's a whole hodgepodge of terms that now they're organo sedimentary deposit. That part's okay, but one person's stromatolite is not another person's stromatolite. One person's thrombolite might not be another person's thrombolite, and uh, you gotta be very cognizant of that. What really makes it bad is this overarching term now is also starting to include this and this, tufas. And these by themselves are kind of uh, in a state of flux. I think most of us would have always thought, uh, tufa, travertine, travertine forms by warmer fluids. But this is the most recent, you know, formal definition out of the AGI glossary. And Hank Chaffetz here at the University of Houston helped write the definition. And it doesn't, it says heated and or ambient temperature waters. Biotically and or abiotically precipitated. So to some people, it's a microbial item. To some people, it's not. And it's to the point now where there's microbial like, or stromatolite like tufas. Tufa like stromatolites. So we'll see where this goes. And it gets worse you know, with this one. So a variety of travertine. So the latest definitions, I think, have set off a bit of an uproar between the tufaologist and travertinologist, and everybody's in a bit of state of flux with what's microbial and what's not. So if in any way this precipitation that makes travertines and tufas is influenced by microbial activity, then it's microbial. All right, enough of that. Overview of analogs. So starting from square one, you want to learn something about carbonate lake systems in rift settings. Um, want to learn something about you know, maybe the South Atlantic margin at some point does become more marine. So a marginal marine analog or two, and maybe even a marine rift setting or two. That was sort of the driver for putting together a collection of analogs. This kind of summarizes them. You have to start here. The, the classic East African rift lakes, and there's a series of them I'll quickly walk you through. We broadened that with, by adding some lakes in the western US, and mostly because they're not all sitting technically in rift settings, but they're very well studied. Added a few small lakes in uh, western Australia. <coughs> they're puny but they have world-class microbial story to them, stromatolites and thrombolites. Then wanted to bring in the, <coughs> the uh, sort of marine, marginal marine here in Western Australia and marine here in the Red Sea. So this is sort of the collection of analogs that I'll walk you through. They all attracted us because they have literature. They've been studied. So you know, we didn't go out and do field work in all these areas, a couple of them. But, 
we could build off the literature, and um, they all had identified carbonates. A shortcoming is hardly any of them have mapped carbonates, but we'll come back to that point. So here's the series of lake analogs that I chose from the East African Rift System, and they're kind of shown there with digital elevation models, and they're kind of shown here, but from north to south. And a couple of these were, are ones that uh, the Syracuse group has worked on in the past and is working on now, but this one's a good one. And the reason, there's extensive shoreline carbonates. Some are skeletal sands, uh, but some are uh, low relief shoreline parallel stromatolite belts, little microbial encrustations around the edges. Locally, there might be travertines in places. And a nice thing is there's an outcrop record, in addition to what's growing at present day lake level, there's outcrop records of previous lake level highs, all right? And this one, um, well published on, but much less well known than that one, uh, there's a outcrop record of high lake level stromatolites, but notice this term from their publications, hydrothermal stromatolites, so that's one of these kind of travertine stromatolite crossovers, I think. This one's quite a good one, <clears throat> and one that, you know, if there was a perfect world, I think would be over there doing a project on the ground there, because there's a lot of opportunity to do some mapping in this one, but nobody's done it yet. Two lakes that at a lake level high stand were merged together. Today they're separate, and in fact one's dry. But they have stromatolites that are really pretty good, local travertines, and again a good outcrop record of a high lake level, and that's the attraction there, I think. You can actually see it on Landsat imagery, you could map it out. This one has stromatolites. It's uh, published on by people that were looking at climate studies at the time. And this one has the shoreline carbonates, and again, outcrop record at various lake levels of stromatolites and thrombolites. So there's data to be learned from these areas, from the literature. There's not a one of them, though, that you can make a map. I know there's stromatolites because they've been collected all around the, an old lake level and they've been radiocarbon age dated and that fits into a, a curve of where the position of lake level was at some tens of thousand years in the past. Or the people looked at the uh, geochemistry of the stromatolites, but nobody made the map. You know, is it what's in between where you collected the stromatolite heads? Is it a continuous belt? What's the facies relationships up dip, down dip, next door? So there's not one of these yet <clears throat> that has a map around the modern or the paleo shoreline. So that's a shortcoming. <clears throat> Which is why I found some of these examples to be even more attractive. So technically, you could argue the point, maybe they're not, strictly speaking, rift related. They're, uh, but they've all been well studied. And you'll see in a minute, I'll show you more on a couple of these. Great Salt Lake and its precursor, Lake Bonneville, you know, a huge lake system in the western U.S. There's <coughs> shoreline carbonates that have been known for a long time. Significant oolite deposits in the beaches and the shorelines, especially <coughs> around the southern margin. There's modern and Pleistocene microbialites. And uh, there's a current project I'll show you a little bit about later that's really showing how significant the bioherms are across the floor of Great Salt Lake, much more than anybody realized. <clears throat> and there is an outcrop record of high lake level deposits. The, the lake levels for these ancestral Great Salt Lake basins have been well defined. But the mapping of carbonates or clastics around those old paleo shorelines hasn't really been done in detail. <clears throat> this one's a classic one. A lot of people have gone there lately. A lot of people are running little field trips to Mono Lake in California. It's precursor Russell Lake. It's one of the you know, type sections for tufas related to spring, sort of debouching along uh, the shorelines very locally. And there's also an outcrop record of some high lake level deposits. There's some uh, access problems to outcrops there. Pyramid Lake, a uh, similar sort of tufa, um, now you know, internationally known locality. Its precursor is probably the best studied lake system in the world, Lake Lahont, by the USGS and driven by climate studies. Lots of data to build off of there. So a really nice record of high lake level, but again, not a real carbonate mapping sort of effort. This one, uh, 
maybe best known because Hollywood goes there to make movies and commercials. Uh, it's got uh, a terrain that kind of looks like Mars or Western, the old Westerns. That's the kind of movies that are made there because there's tufas all over the place. And it's got a neat outcrop record that has been identified and mapped out to some extent by the USGS. So out of these examples, there's the opportunity to do some mapping. And honestly, that's what I was most interested in, the spatial distribution of different types of carbonates in these systems. You know, how big of a footprint and what types of carbonates. So we looked at these two little puny lakes in Western Australia uh, because they're very well known for their stromatolites and thrombolites. Um, a fair amount of work by uh, biologists and geologists and some good publications. And then we wanted to bring in the marine or marginal marine. So here in Northwest Australia, sort of the classic area, Shark Bay, uh, you know, seawater that gets restricted by a shallow sill and all the way around the lake, pretty prolific growth of intertidal and subtidal stromatolites. And then I would say rift system, marine deposits, where else but the Red Sea. So we really looked there and looked at the distribution of coral reefs and associated carbonates, skeletal sands, as potential, uh, say, reservoir-forming units in a marine rift setting. And this one turned, about, turned out to be the best example to use as the case study for showing how we might try and approach a quantitative investigation. Here we can do it because the, you can see the carbonate deposits in this clear, shallow water on Landsat imagery. And it's very robust along both sides of the Red Sea, where all of these other lacustrine basins, it's not mapped out well enough, or it's just hard to see underwater. So these are the, this is the suite of analogs. Early rift lakes from East Africa, the other lakes from the Western US and Australia, and our marginal marine and marine basins. So I'd say this collection, and again, it's not exhaustive, but it's pretty good for starters. It's, um, it can serve as analogs from a variety of perspectives. So what do I mean by that? You know, every day people come to us, you know, the specialist in the company, I want an analog for this. You know, I want an analog for Brazil. I say, well, what do you mean? You want an analog for facies, for porosity evolution, diagenesis? Do you want an, you know, what, what do you want the analog for? Because there's not one of these analogs that's the perfect match for anything that we deal with in the subsurface. But if you know how to pick and choose the characteristics, then maybe you can build from a suite of analogs, you know, a more robust geological model. So if your driver is, I actually want a lacustrine basin that's in a rift setting, well, pick the one that's got an X by it. If I want an analog that's really a big lake system, not one of these little puny ones, pick one that's got the X by it. What do I mean by this? This is one that's a series of sub-basins that get varyingly connected or disconnected as the lake level goes up and down. So it's a complex pattern of sub-basins. The X's mark the, the, the good ones. Ones where the literature has documented the changes over time. People have actually identified and timed the position of the lake level. I want ones that actually have microbial carbonates. Now the caveat there, my microbial might not be your microbial, but this would be using the broadest definition. These have stromatolites, thrombolites, you know, dendrolites or something, and tufas or travertines separately, and then these with the marine carbonate. So analogs illustrating different aspects, okay? The other way to look at this plot would be if, if I really want to understand the spatial distribution, say at the exploration scale, or the big grouping of reservoirs, the, a variety of skills, but say for larger scale mapping, interpretation of seismic, you know, well data where we have a few wells and we have to really interpret in between. And it's at the regional or sub-regional or sort of prospect scale. That would be sort of this, you know, these three columns to me. The big patterns in lake system changes over time, all right? If we want the analog more for I just got a core and I'm looking at something in my core, what the heck is it? All right, thin section. You know, I want the characteristics to better interpret, maybe it's seismic, a detail to cores or logs, image logs, 
then it's more of this, this type of stuff. So if you're, this is your driver or this is your driver, you might pick and choose from these analogs in a different way. So the reason for spending a few minutes on that, <clears throat> if you are interested in this, this is where you would go to get it. This is not a plug. What is a plug? So this is published as what's called a SCPM short course notes, because we did a short course at the APG meeting um, last year. And it's a digital product. There's two DVDs in it. And it has this whole talk, but a lot more. So one DVD has a very lengthy, well-illustrated introductory paper, which is kind of this talk, broadened a bit. But it's also got a bunch of folders in it. So there's a folder for each of those analog areas. And if you open any one of those folders, there's all this stuff. So there's an overview chapter. There's uh, links to Google Earth KMZ files. There's uh, Geo PDF files, if you know what those are. There's a whole bunch of images and maps that we made. There's a whole bunch of photographs that maybe uh, colleagues took on the ground. So you could pull out of that something that you could pull into your own uh, poster displays or PowerPoints and get a real jump start on your analogs right away. The other DVD is the GIS. So it's set up to uh, be run by a you know, GIS master. Uh, it's set up to be run in Arc Explorer, kind of a dumbed down GIS front end. And it's got a lot of user ready files that are uh, really put together in a nice way. All right, so you're interested in the analogs, you buy this. But what are some things you could do with it? So I want to spend the rest of the talk showing you some examples of how you could use the data. So the examples aren't to show you <clears throat> what a stromatolite looks like in court. They're not to show you what something looks like in the thin section. This is more the big picture. You know, what's the spatial distribution? What would things map out like? And I'm going to walk you through uh, you know, kind of quickly sort of four, let's say, analogs. And the first one, uh, the first sort of pair, um, these lake systems, these are the larger lake systems, Pyramid Lake, Great Salt Lake, but they're precursors in the Western US. They're really the best examples, largely because of work that the US Geological Survey has done over the decades to show the magnitude of change in size, shape, and complexity of a lake system. And I would say the potential impact of that change on carbonate formation. There's carbonates identified in those systems, but maybe the timing of the carbonates is not well known enough to actually know at what point in the lake, changing lake system those carbonates were uh, growing the most. This one's really nice, Cyril's Lake in California, uh, to show the extent of tufas related to a particular lake level. So I'll actually show you a map and show what the lake looked like and where the tufas are in the lake and sort of speculate why. Then, uh, so those are lake examples. So big picture changes, also a big picture change with better mapping of the carbonates. But again, you don't see any East African rift lakes in this one because the mapping of the carbonates there is not sufficient. We'll jump to the marginal marine setting to show you, use it as an example to show the uh, spatial distribution of different types of stromatolites in this restricted marine setting. And then the Red Sea, it's a very robust, it's a very reefy system and a lot of associated skeletal sand production. So it's the one we use to illustrate our quantitative interrogation of depositional patterns. And if we had the same opportunity to do that for a one of these lacustrine basins, you could use the same approaches. Right? So here's Pyramid Lake. I mean, a lot of people, I think, have heard of this, and probably the reason is because of this little part right here, which is shown here, and these little lines are lines of very high relief mounds or pinnacles of tufa. Everybody's going there nowadays, it's a hot place. Uh, most of this is a Native American reservation, soft limits. Apparently Italians can get in. Giovanna Del Porta is doing some field work there. But, uh, so this is Pyramid Lake, this little thing here. And what this shows is a configuration of what that lake system might have looked like at different times in its geologic past when lake level was higher. So we made a digital elevation model. Let's say 
improve the digital elevation model from uh, topographic maps that are available. And we sort of superimpose highlighted different contours. So the modern lake system, uh, one that was uh, a little older at a little higher position of lake level. So there's more blue than the modern. And then the maximum extent of that lake system was when it was Lake Lahontan in the most, it's a geologic, the oldest part of the system. So there's some lake level changes captured on this. Remember that aspect of, of complexity? Uh, this would be the prime example of that. And here's sort of a way to tear that apart. <clears throat> so here's modern day Pyramid Lake. It's defined by this contour. And it covers about 450 square kilometers. So this would be at a slightly higher contour interval that we know from some radiocarbon dating work that was done on stromatolites associated with that interval are about 11 or 12,000 years ago. That is maybe a little bit of an approximation. So here's actually a curve that's been published of lake level change through time. So here's the height of lake level, all right? Here's where we are today, 1165. And this position would be right here. And this goes back 100,000, 200,000, 300,000 years. So back through the quaternary. And so you can see lake level was up and down and up and down and way up to there. And that's this guy. So at about that age, this lake level changed. This was the largest extent of Lake Lahontan, the most complexity to the subbasin. And, <clears throat> you know, at this intermediate stage, there's seven different lake systems, I guess you'd call them, um, covering about 6,500 square kilometers. So the big one here, a big one, but intricate one here, and some smaller ones down here. And at this one, you know, this is the maximum extent, the maximum depth of Lake Lahontan, just less than 300 meters deep. It's 100 meters deep now. It's pretty deep. And it covered uh, over 22,000 square kilometers. So, you know, pretty dramatic changes in size, depth, shape, complexity, and over a relatively short time frame. So lake level change happens quickly, pretty quickly at a time like this, where it's glacial changes going on and if you're in sort of the right climatic setting. And most of the uh, tufas that we go to look at here today, if the age dates hold up, they fall in between about 13,000 and 20,000 years old. So they formed you know, in this corner of Pyramid Lake, but maybe at this time or more likely this time. More work needs to be done on the dating of the tufas there, and if one could do it, maybe a bit more mapping. So there was some really good work done there by the survey. So the, the documentation of the changes in lake level and the changes in complexity and the connectivity of the subbasins, that's pretty good, that previous diagram illustrated. But you know, what's, what's the story of how that might impact carbonate development? So I would say this is observational and might change if we had more data, but the changes in lake level and configuration probably can impact the potential for carbonate precipitation by doing what? By varying the amount and composition of runoff that drains into the lakes. So where's the water come from that fills the lake? There's a river flowing into it. There's a lot of runoff from the surrounding terrain. So it's a big deal what the waters are flowing through before they get to the lake and times of high lake level versus low lake level, and how does the groundwater flux into the lake system change? The connectivity between various subbasins changes. So between the different subbasins that are separate basins when lake is low, there's effectively sills. And they might be under a little bit of water, and water might be flowing over those sills vigorously, or they might be deeper and water's flowing more sluggishly across them. So a portion of a complicated lake system can be open, an open system, and another portion at the same time could be a closed system. And remember that first diagram about the speculation of what the South Atlantic margin might have looked like, a bunch of little sub-basins. Well, we 
drill one or look at the results of drilling for one, do we really understand what all the other little sub-basins might be doing simultaneously? Probably not. Could be different kinds of carbonate at the same time because of this aspect. So the runoff across the terrain comes into a lake, the groundwater flows through the surrounding terrain into the lake, and you know, as maybe debouching as springs along the shorelines or along faults and fractures up through the bottom of the lake. And all that can change with the changes in lake level. So the observations around the uh, Pyramid Lake, uh, that part of Lake Lahontan, the thickest tufa deposits seem to have formed near lake bottom sites uh, where there was groundwater discharge. So there was groundwater coming up along springs, the springs are kind of coming up along cracks, joints, fractures, there's a lineation to the tufa mounds for the most part. There's also some overflow points, these would be the sills between the sub-basins where there's carbonate accretion on some bedrock, and that may be, again the dating might be suspect here, but where you have uh, water near constant level of lake position and there's water moving across the sill for a long period of time. Maybe you get that <coughs> happening. It's interesting, you look at the top elevation of a lot of the tufa mounds and it corresponds roughly to the uh, elevation of some of the sills at the edges of the subbasin. If you're above that, you probably get erosion of tufa. Sure, we can precipitate stromatolites, we can precipitate tufas, but we also want to preserve them so you can have some erosion uh, if you're in the wrong position when lake level falls. And it does seem like with a major fall of lake level in this system, the story seems to be that the large scale precipitation of the tufas uh, stopped. So I'm going to jump over to Great Salt Lake to sort of continue this theme of changing lake level complexity to the lake system. So this is another nice one to show the lake level change in size, shape, and configuration. This is modern day Great Salt Lake. And it's sort of shown in here, but there's a bunch of colors now on this one. And this would be the darkest blue is the modern Great Salt Lake in here that you see here. And then the lighter and lighter shades of blue until you finally get to the gray are sort of increasing lake levels and increasing size and complexity of Lake Bonneville. But it has a lot of names. You know, the different shorelines have been mapped out, have different names, with the largest one, the oldest one, being Lake Bonneville. So we can take this sort of uh, amalgamated lake edge map and break it apart like we did before. And again, have a, 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 cur a plot here that shows increasing time, and <coughs> increasing elevation, so a change in lake level of Great Salt Lake, Lake Bonneville through time that's come from published literature, published studies. So here's modern day Great Salt Lake. Yeah, it's big, right? A lot of you have been there. I mean, almost 6,000 square kilometers and very complex in itself. But you kind of go back now through increasing elevations and increasing time, again, based on radiocarbon age dating of shoreline deposits of stromatolites or thrombolites or microbial laminates. And you look how much larger and how much more intricate and more complex that lake system was. So, you know, big there, the time it was associated with the Gilbert shoreline, the Lake Provo sort of outline, I mean, really big and really intricate. And this is the biggest, Lake Bonneville, and a previous one it was a little smaller. So at this time, it's the maximum surface area, it's 10 times bigger than here, and much more, there's probably a way of quantitatively expressing the complexity, but a lot more complex. A lot of sub-basins connected up. Most of the shoreline attached uh, tufa encrustations that people have identified and, and talked about, their dating shows that they form, um, a lot of them seem to have formed at this time, and some maybe the oldest ones formed at this time. So this seems to be a time when there was a lot happening around the edges. But there's a, a PhD project, I'll show you a slide in a second, that's underway right now, and, and he's actually mapping um, underwater just microbial buildups all over the place. And some of Robert Baskin's preliminary radiocarbon dates show about 
12.5 kiloyears. So they're across the floor of modern Great Salt Lake, but they may have formed when it looked like this in the very recent past. So this is something to keep your eye on. He's given a talk at an APG. He was a very uh, good participant in a Hedberg conference we had here a year or so ago. But he's still finishing up his PhD at the University of Utah in the Department of Geography. Uh, and guided along by Paul Wright quite a bit from, from British Gas. But he's torn apart Great Salt Lake. All these lines are where he's done side scan sonar, he shot and chirp data, he's done bathymetric profile. And this is some of his bottom imaging, and all these little bumps are microbialites. The floor of Great Salt Lake is covered with these little bumps, and he's actually mapping it out in great detail. So, you know, let him finish. This will be a prime example to be able to show the spatial dis distribution of different types of microbialites. And he's actually doing that as part of his. Uh, his PhD. This is what I like. Uh, Cyril's Lake, <coughs> it's, uh, this is the movie set. Um, a Star Trek was filmed there, a bunch of commercials. It's these just exquisite tufa buildups, kind of out past Palm Springs in California, but up to about 37 meters high. Some of them are coalesced, have a big footprint, pretty big. Uh, there's a linear pattern to this grouping of them, but not all of them. So people go there to see these. Uh, surprisingly, not that many people go geologists, but there are growing numbers. So we uh, did our little thing with the imagery and the digital elevation model. We made an outline of modern day Cyril's Lake, and this would be the precursor, Russell Lake. And we put that on this map a DEM. All the little red blotches here are where the USGS, a publication by Smith et al, mapped tufa deposits. So this is the one where there's been the most on the ground field work and mapping. And the little, this little area is down in here where there's a linear arrangement of tufa buildups so and there's another one there. But here's a lot of sort of shoreline parallel ones. And it's quite interesting, after I did this, I found, started talking with Hank Chaffetz here in town, and he's done work on one of these buildups, and he and a postdoc have a core through one, and they published a really nice petrographic study uh, on one of the cores through one of the tufa buildups that shows how the details of the precipitation change during a high stand, and if you want to use that term, high lake level and low lake level position. So these buildups growing out in the floor of Cyril's Lake, fed by springs, seem to be growing during, during times of lake level change, but not at the same rates and not with the same textures. So that's sort of their story. I just wanted to illustrate the mapping story. So notice they're not over here. They're kind of not in there. They're in this sub-basin, and they're only pretty much along that side. Right? So we're able to kind of extract from that map a couple of images. So here would be sort of the maximum extent of that lake system. Well, these guys, based on some radiocarbon dating, which again probably should be redone, they were younger than that. So they probably formed when the lake looked like this. This basin wasn't there, it wasn't contributing, it was separated by a sill, but you had a you know, pretty good sized basin. And all those little red dots from the previous map are shown here. So I kind of, I'm a lumper, not a splitter. So I took all the little red dots and made it one big red splotch. So this would be the map of, in which you would find tufa deposits, but not everywhere in that red polygon would you find con continuous tufa deposits. But it's kind of cool. So this is the outline, the size of Cyril's Lake. And you add up all the red, and it's that size. So you could say, well, in this system anyway, it's like 20% of the lake might be floored by carbonates. The sort of uh, elongate projections are like the classic area where they're aligned along a fracture or fault system or joint system and the springs are coming up through that. But then there's also ones that are uh, adjacent to the shoreline. So that could be springs along the shoreline. These could have something to do with the sill type of effect. And you could actually use the DEM that we created, and, and Hank Chaffetz has picked up on this. You can demonstrate that maybe these guys were forming 
had a certain uh, water depth in the, in the lake and it was deeper up here. So they may have been forming on the lake bottom, springs coming through fractures on the lake bottom and waters that were up to 200 meters deep. So why is, why is there this asymmetry? You know, a lot of these sub-basins that we see in rift set settings are asymmetric, right? Well, this one was. It's got a very steep edge here and a very, almost like a ramp-like eastern edge, very just gradually getting deeper, deeper, deeper. So the thought is that uh, the winds were blowing sort of this way and this side, you know, maybe it's just too shallow, but it was always too churned up by waves. The wind was generating a lot of wave activity. Was there carbonate precipitation? Probably. There's a lot of carbonate mud there, so a notion might be it's equivalent to whitings in the Bahamas. This precipitation of mud out of uh, the lake water may be microbially mediated, but not tufa deposits in this case. So maybe some different types of carbonate development because it was steep, uh, the springs are sort of concentrated here, it was a more gentle slope, it does have carbonate, mud and maybe some uh, clamshells, but not the tufas. So I want to give a plug, uh, my colleague Cody is back here, a couple of you took time to look at the poster that he brought. Uh, after we finished this study, you know, out of all the lakes, um, I was a little not pleased that we couldn't map, do more mapping, <laughs> just not enough mapping has been done. So Cody helped us uh, find this example, and it's something that, you know, we'll get there at some point, we haven't been there yet. If you're interested in this, you can take a look at the poster, but it's a lake in Argentina. It's uh, famous for big fish. Big fish mean a lot of food, brine shrimp. Lots of brine shrimp, <clears throat> shrimp mean there's something screwy going on in the water. And that same kind of screwy thing makes carbonates, maybe. Well, indeed it does. We looked at photographs online and there's you know, guys standing there with their big bass and they're standing on stromatolites. So, uh, Cody's put together some nice pictures, there's a few more on the poster, but basically this is a nice one because you can use um, Landsat to a little bit, but we got a hold of the QuickBird imagery and you can use the spectral signal that's in it to not only map out carbonates that seem to go all the way around this lake, but you see some different blues and that's different aspects of the carbonates. So you can do some pretty robust facies mapping at modern lake level and along some paleo shorelines just from the imagery, which is quite a nice opportunity. So we've got a poster that describes a little bit of that and it's something we're still kicking around with. So moving away from the lakes for the last two examples, Shark Bay in Western Australia, it's sort of the classic area, right, that um, even if you're as old as me, you learned about it in school. But what you learned about was the intertidal stromatolites. It turns out that the subtitle stromatolite story there is much more robust. People just didn't realize it back then. So there's a, a recent series of papers. Ricardo Genet works for Petrobras. He got sent over to do a PhD in Australia with Lindsay Collins. They did some nice, nice papers. One on the stromatolites, one on coquinas. And, and this is sort of a extraction of some of the, his mapping so he mapped from imagery, he did some field checking, um, and made a map, and this is all of his facies coding. I sort of high graded it a little bit, but <clears throat> I'd say there's microbial structures equal stromatolites, thrombolites in this case, that grow in specific settings according to water depth. So that's not exactly new. We've always draw cross sections and show water depth and maybe the growth forms of the microbialites change, maybe the biologists get involved and they can tell us it's different microbial communities, different water depths. <clears throat> but what was interesting is the buildups, these could be little head-like buildups or coalesce buildups that maybe some of, some of us would refer to as patch reefs. <clears throat> They're common in intertidal and subtidal down to two and a half meters of water depth. And then there's microbial layers or pavements that go out Across even at six meters water depth. So this underwater aspect of the story was a bit more significant than I think um, we realized, say, say from the old studies by Brian Logan. 
And that's sort of summarized here, and I could further summarize it, say here, we've sort of draped the um, microbialite, the stromatolite facies belts on the Landsat image, kind of a nice display, all right? <clears throat> and um, this is the size of the Shark Bay embayment. Remember, there's a sill up here. You can faintly see it on the Landsat. And this is seawater that comes in and gets restricted circulation and salinities go up and the temperatures vary and all that. But about 40% of Shark Bay, the embayments area, is covered by some type of microbialite. The subtitle, back when I was in school, this was intertidal. That was it. The subtitle aspect of this story, which is these pavements, which are very thin, laterally extensive but very thin, but also the buildups, they actually occupy 15 times the area of the intertidal. So from a spatial distribution, much more significant. And that's the, the size of the prize, if you will. And the, uh, not all of the subtidal deposits are significant buildups. If you just look at the buildups and add it all up, they cover about 90 square kilometers. And they're still puny, probably by our standards. Buildups as high as one and a half meters. But they form um, patch reef complexes, if you want to use that term. It can be up to a half a kilometer wide. And they arrange themselves in belts parallel to the shoreline. Maybe that's no surprise. So I'd say you know, this is the kind of information you could start to extract if you have the data to work with. So this looks, this looks pretty good. I'll give another plug now to my alma mater, the group down at Miami. Um, there's a PhD student, Erica. She's working with uh, Pam Reed and several of our companies are supporting. And they're redoing the, the mapping in a lot more detail. So they're, they're working all the way around Shark Bay and they're shooting side scan sonar. They're uh, with permission, obviously, permitting from the government. This is a World Heritage Site. They're collecting uh, hundreds of stromatolite heads for geological, geochemical, biological analysis. <laughs> They've got these exquisite um, high resolution bottom images showing each of these is a stromatolite, but showing differences in the seafloor. So they're coming up with a much more robust map. And when she finishes a year and a half or so, there'd be an opportunity to redo what I just showed you with the other map, but with maybe a better field constrained sort of mapping. Now this is the last area. This is sort of if you know, what happens when the rift becomes fully open and fully marine? Well, the Red Sea might be one scenario. And this is a great area, I'd have to say. I didn't know that much about it until I got involved with this study. <laughs> and working a lot with uh, Sam Perkis, he's done a lot of work on this side of the Red Sea, working with the uh, Saudi Arabian government. But we um, wanted to use this as an example to show how you can do some quantitative interrogation carbonate patterns of deposition in a rift setting. What's nice about the Red Sea, first of all, would be its size. This is 500 kilometers. So this is huge, you know, 1,200 kilometers. It covers 20 degrees of latitude. It covers a whole bunch of gradient in uh, climate. And, you know, those of you that know about the Red Sea, there's places where clastics are coming in a lot more and building topography and influencing carbonates and places where they're not. So you could look at a lot of climate and mixed carbonate clastic scenarios along this. So we did a little bit of that, but that really wasn't the focus. We picked six study areas. There are boxes that are shown there. They look kind of puny, but each box is a, a Landsat image that covers 40 by 40 kilometers. So Landsat ETM. So the areas are big. They just look small because the Red Sea is so big. And the sites together cover a pretty big footprint, 1,600 square kilometers. And we chose these areas closely to capture some of the variability in the big picture. Some are more nearshore occurrences of carbonate. Some are more offshore. Some have a lot of antecedent topography, basement highs. Some don't. Some have more salt movement going on. Some don't. So we tried to cover a range of styles. And these are the, the raw Landsat images, color images for each one. So what's kind of neat, <clears throat> the water's clear, the water's shallow, the carbonate reefs and associated sand build right up to shallow depths. So you can really see them nicely. So we can make very accurate <coughs> maps of the reefs, which are shown in, uh, this is the same area, one of the six areas. The reef shown in purple, 
and the skeletal sands shown in yellow. SAM has been the field check two of these areas and there's been some publications on two more. So like four of the six areas, there's a lot of ground truthing to support this. So once you've done this, basically you've made polygons on a map. And that's where the quantitative interrogation could come in. We could look at the number of polygons. We could look at the size of the polygons. We could look at the shape of the polygons. We could look at the spacing patterns, the elongation of the polygons. And that's the quantitative interrogation. So this is a, <clears throat> this is a size analysis. I can't remember the number in this exact example, but most of these have about, I don't know, some hundred of polygons, let's say, in each uh, Landsat image. And we did a sort of a size analysis, and uh, basically it shows uh, you know, a lot of small polygons and fewer and fewer big ones, as you'd expect. But basically you can get a curve, and you can plot it on a long log plot, and you know, people get all intrigued by the curvature on a plot like this. If it's straight, it's fractal, and if it's not straight, it's not fractal, and there's a bunch of you know, arguing going on about reef systems tend to often look fractal, and we've done similar studies in uh, like oolitic sand deposits in the Bahamas, and they're not, so what's going on? But for this analysis, it was sort of a, it's a quantitative way of taking away the size distribution. And you can derive a, you know, a, a curve from this. So why might that be important? You know, if you're working, try to build a geocellular model for a subsurface study, and say your goal is to um, put into that geological objects, reefs. Most companies now are, are doing that, building geological models, then putting in porosity and per permeability later. And one approach to building those kind of models is with multiple point statistics. And to run those kind of models, you have to tell the computer program what's the range of sizes, what's the mean size, and what's the range of sizes. And you can do the same with shape, and you can do the same with spatial information. Well, this is one way of getting after some of those numbers. So if you look at, in that Red Sea setting, we have the reefs and associated skeletal sand, skeletal grainstones. If you lump those two things together, to me that would be the potential reservoir body, and everything else around it's too deep, it's muddier, all right? So this is our six study areas, and these funny color patterns, this would be the, the size of the prize, all right? So this is the potential reservoir bodies, and they're called width maps, and, and basically it's just the bigger it gets, you'll see this, this sort of color shading. But it, there's different ways of displaying this, but it shows the amalgamation of the reefs and skeletal sands, how big that little fairway can get, but it's also illustrating the size and the shape and the orientation. And again, the uh, areas were chosen in some, there's a lot of antecedent topography, so this would be islands. Um, others, the carbonate occurrence was near shore. Others, it was completely offshore. So we could look at the size and the shape and the orientation of the potential reservoir bodies relative to topography, shoreline, other, other aspects. And this was sort of one way to do it. So this is those uh, potential reservoir bodies again. The six different areas, let's call them geobodies. So what's their orientation? Right. So here's the Red Sea, and we looked at the orientation of the geobodies relative to the orientation of the rift of the Red Sea. Right. And if something's colored in red on the left, it pretty much has the orientation of the Red Sea. That means that particular reef is either sitting right against the shoreline, and the shorelines are parallel to the elongation of the rift, or, if it's offshore, it's sitting on a, some structure that's, it is paralleling the trend of the rift. So the red is oriented parallel to the big picture, and the, say this color, whatever that is, greenish, yellowish green, it's sort of uh, slightly off, and the blue would be the most whacked out, all right? <clears throat> so what's the takeaway from that? Well, if I have a lot of antecedent topography, offshore islands, um, here and here. That controls the local reef distribution. They're fringing the highs, all right? 
And that might be at odds, in fact, it is often at odds with the big picture structural elongation. If I'm a uh, shoreline parallel feature, then I'm hugging a shoreline which is in itself parallel to the rift. So I'm oriented parallel to the rift. But what about these <coughs> offshore ones? So we kind of furthered that by, this is the same sort of notion, but a different kind of display. <clears throat> so these are our six study areas, but now they have big circles around them. And what you see here is the orientation of all the faults that have been mapped either onshore or offshore in seismic that we could pull out of published literature. And then we, uh, and this is some of the papers that we pulled it out. So it's the tectonic grain of the Red Sea. And then we took our areas again, and uh, you know, these would be all of our potential reservoir bodies, our geobodies. So we looked at their orientation. So we looked at the orientation of all of the geobodies relative to the orientation of the, the structures again. And it sort of supports the story before, except now it shows us that the ones that were offshore that do turn out to be parallel, they happen to be sitting in areas where there's a, a lot of faults and the local faults are paralleling the big story as well. So if you're near shore, you're paralleling the shoreline. If you're offshore, you could be sitting on a, somehow a, a fault high, a drape over a fault that also controls your pattern. So if you don't know anything else in a rift setting, and you wanna know, well, what's the orientation of my potential reservoir gonna be? You know, this kind of notion might turn out to be valuable. And furthermore, you could pull out sizes and shapes. And there's a bit more, <clears throat> it it's shows here, but the smaller bodies, the real smaller reefs, they're least elongate and least oriented. The bigger bodies are, um, have an orientation. So you might know that the, you know, the bigger ones that might matter in a subsurface world, they might be the ones that you could actually have some predictability about, you know, to be looked at. So that's sort of the walkabout in a well, in a, from a, a little rationale, the overview, and some examples. Um, and these were the, <clears throat> say, the main takeaway points. Um, you know, I started this off by saying it was a set of analogs uh, put together because people kept bugging me with questions. Um, but I have to say, I learned a lot by pulling these together and trying to summarize them. And the analogs, for the third time, it's not an exhaustive suite. There are people in this room that probably already know a bunch of analogs that are their minds better than these. But they do show a spectrum of sizes, shapes, styles of deposition for lacustrine and marine settings. And with that in your arsenal, you know, you do know a little bit more, just bone up on these analogs, you'll know a little bit more on the types of carbonates that are in these kinds of systems. Um, we put an emphasis on microbialites and tufas, thinking that, well, there's ooids in lakes, but those, we kind of know where they are, I think. Um, <clears throat> maybe coquinas in lakes, kind of know where they form, but these we thought we knew the less about. So with that kind of knowledge, you know, maybe we can infer more from seismic, sub-seismic patterns of deposition or infer more between uh, you know, widely spaced cores. Not all of the examples, but several of them show the location and various styles of carbonate deposition um, with changes in lake level and uh, your present and past lake margins. You could start to understand maybe how things change through time, but I'd say more needs to be looked at on that. And gave some clues, I think, in the, if you had more map data, how you can <coughs> investigate the spatial patterns. Then again, if, if this is something you want to learn more about the specific analogs or the, this methodology, it's really captured quite nicely in this digital product. And I'd say, showed you this at the beginning, um, which analog would I use? Well, I don't, there's no one analog that you use, but I think if you have a whole bunch of analogs, especially for a big system like the South Atlantic margin, you can say, well, the likelihood that down here somewhere, at some point, marine, then maybe there's some data to pull out of a Red Sea, and somewhere in here would be sort of marginal marine, how that works, I don't know, but maybe a shark bay, <clears throat> and up in here, you know, I'd be looking at these kinds of systems that we just kind of locked. This is Natron and Magadi from the East African Rift Lake or Cyril's Lake <clears throat> or Lake Lahontan Pyramid Lake. 
where there's some changes through time. And maybe that, you know, getting some handle on that would better understand how these separate sub-basins at times are connected, not connected, and when and where carbonates form in them. So that's the spiel. <laughs>